Reproduction. What is reproduction? Where did that dog learn how to clone itself? Why did that woman eat that baby? Why am I not allowed to eat babies? And why is it that, despite our best efforts, the animals of the world haven't gone extinct yet? Well, the answer is reproduction. Human reproduction is pretty straightforward. When two people love each other very much, they wait until it's nighttime, they go to the bedroom, they turn off the lights, and just when it's getting real hot and steamy, the man slowly reaches down and pulls out his Bible, and they spend the rest of the night studying the good word of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nine months later, they've got freshly cooked babies ready to serve. Now animals also enjoy a good bit of casual reproduction, but since they a can't read and b are full of sin, their methods are pretty different and a lot more uh, creative compared to ours. So without further ado, let's talk about the weird world of animal reproduction. Up first, we have the anglerfish, a species of fish that lives deep in the ocean. The kind of depths where the only creatures you will find are the ones who haven't seen the sun since the 16th century and who subsist purely on the fires of hell. Out of all the weirdest animals in the world, this one's probably pretty high on that list. I mean, the razor-sharp needle-like teeth, the spindly fins, the eyes that have seen horrors beyond comprehension. It's got it all. These fish have a lure on their heads with glowing bacteria inside it, which it uses to give any poor fish that's unlucky enough to reach those depths a false sense of safety before brutally devouring it in the pitch darkness. So of course, the question on everyone's minds, how does an animal like this have sex? Well, that's what people with very specific fetish and the scientists of the 19th century were wondering too. They found a bunch of anglerfish specimens, but all of them turned out to be female. Don't ask me how they found that out, I don't want to know. No male anglerfish had been found so far, but they were also finding a bunch of these smaller, much less scary looking fish that looked kinda similar, but it were thought to be another species. Then, in 1922, a scientist found a female anglerfish with two of these smaller fishes attached to its stomach. Clearly there was something more going on here. And after a few more years of theorizing, the mystery of anglerfish sex was finally solved. What we know as the big scary anglerfish are actually just the female members of the species. The male anglerfish, on the other hand, look very different. These guys are tiny fish who don't have fully formed teeth, jaws, or even a digestive system, which are pretty useful to live really anywhere on earth, especially if you want to live in the ocean's equivalent of Chernobyl. What the males do have are really big noses and really good eyes, and they use these for one purpose and one purpose only. As soon as they're born, they use their sense organs to find a female anglerfish as quickly as possible. Once they do find one, they attach themselves to the female's body and literally fuse to her blood vessels, essentially living off of her like a parasite. Once they do this, all of the male's organs, like its fins and eyes, start withering away, until they're basically a lump of flesh whose only job it is to fertilize the eggs of the female when the time comes. And that's how the male anglerfish lives the rest of his life. Nothing more than a clump of cells clinging to life on a partner that barely knows he's dead. And that's supposed to be the best ending. That's the life of the elite, because only 1% of male anglerfish ever get to experience the great pleasures of being a sperm producing parasite. The rest of them who can't find a mate just starve to death in the cold, dark ocean. It's pretty wild what those anglerfish are willing to do just for the chance to be with a female anglerfish. Thankfully, humans are way smarter than those dumb anglerfish and would never. Speaking of being born to fuck, our next animal also comes into this world with just one goal in mind introducing the Antichinus. This animal lives in Australia, and on the surface, they just look like a pure, innocent little mouse just frolicking across its natural habitat. Well, your first mistake would be to assume that anything from Australia would ever be pure or wholesome. The males of the species only have a lifespan of around 11 months, so they gotta make the most of it as quickly as possible. The mating period of the Antichinus lasts from July to September, and so, around a month before this, the males spend all their energy making as much sperm as possible and storing it in their body. Then, as soon as the mating season starts, it's like a switch gets flipped in their heads and the males have only one goal in mind. They turn into nature's greatest fuck machines, mating with as many partners as possible as fast as their little rodent hearts can handle. These mating sessions can last up to 14 hours straight with no breaks, as the male goes from partner to partner experiencing what I can only imagine is the rat equivalent of injecting heroin straight into your brain cells. But just like injecting heroin straight into your brain cells, this is not very ideal for the male. All that causes in fucking literally causes his body to fall apart, starting with his fur falling off, his body weakening, internal bleeding, and his immune system slowly breaking down, which leads to infections all over his body, causing him to quite literally rot away. But the mad lad still continues, running purely on his evolutionary instinct and also the shit ton of testosterone that's flowing through his system right now. He becomes such a disheveled coomer that even the females start ignoring him. Finally, when his body can no longer go on, the male Antichinus dies, along with pretty much every other male in the species. Three months later, the babies are ready to go out on their own, and the cycle repeats once again. It's a pretty brutal process, and when scientists first saw this, they were concerned, to say the least. 
One theory is that the males die off after mating so that the next generation of children can have enough food to live. Another theory is that evolution just kinda did that one day, and I mean hey, if it works, it works. Sure, it involves the brutal death of every male in the species, but results are results. At the end of the day, their lifespan might be shorter than a year, but they definitely go out with a bang. Like and subscribe. Now our next organism isn't a horny animal itself, but has learned to make use of horny animals for its own benefit. This is the Ophrys apifera. It's a species of orchid that's found all over Europe and North Africa. Now during the mating process, Plants make something called pollen, which is a powdery substance that carries the plant's genes. It's basically the plant equivalent of sperm cells, which just makes hay fever a lot creepier. The mating process is complete when this pollen is transferred from one flower to another, and this is done in a number of ways, like using wind or hoping that an animal brushes some pollen off. But instead of waiting on random chance, the Ophrys apifera takes a few notes from the great big world of internet pop-up ads. You know the ones. You're just trying to pirate a movie at 4am when you're suddenly blasted with a barrage of ads for dick enlargement pills and pussy wars that nobody in their right mind would ever click on. Right? Well, as you'll soon find out, the entire animal kingdom does a lot of weird shit when it's horny. The flower itself is coloured in a way that makes it look like a female bee's ass sticking up, and the flower also releases chemicals that smell like a female bee. So to the unsuspecting male bee passing by, a field of these orchids just look like a bunch of hot bee singles in his area ready to fuck. So he gets to work on one of them, tries his hardest, and this causes his body to get covered in pollen. Eventually, depending on how desperate he is, he finally realizes that he's been fooled and flies away. A few minutes later, he finds another one of these orchids, and I would be lying if I said that he'd learned from his previous mistakes. And so, pollen gets transferred from one flower to another, and the mating process is complete. For the orchid, that is, all the bee got were crippling blue balls and definitely a new fetish. Then the next animal on our list is the flatworm. As the name suggests, these guys are very flat and very well. They live in coral reefs and at the bottom of the ocean, and their mating process is slightly more complicated than normal. Flatworms are hermaphrodites, which means that they have both male and female reproductive organs and can choose to be either. So you might be wondering, if two flatworms meet up and decide to mate, how do they decide which one's going to be male and which one's going to be female? As in, how do they decide who is going to give the sperm and who is giving the eggs? Well, like many things in life, sometimes the solution is just to get your dicks out and have a good old fashioned sword fight. This is the ancient art of penis fencing. Yep, that's what it's officially called. And as the name suggests, there's a lot of fencing, but more importantly, a lot of penis. When two flat ones want to mate, they go near each other and start dueling. Their penises are kind of pointy, and the goal is to pierce the skin of the other flatworm and inject their genes directly into its bloodstream. Flatworms don't do an elaborate mating ritual or go to a romantic process, they just stab their dicks into their mate and get the job done. Once a flatworm is poked, its egg get fertilized and the battle ends. The winner of the fight becomes the father, while the loser becomes the mother. For legal reasons, I will not be commenting on this. Becoming the mother means that the flatworm has to do more work to find food for the growing baby, so it's generally considered better to be the one doing the poking rather than the one being poked. Once the battle ends, the mother goes off to find food for their new babies, while the father heads off for more rounds of some good old penis fencing. They continue this until they eventually lose and become a mother themselves. In some species, the penis fencing is less of a competition and more of a trade-off, where both flatworms stab one another and fertilize each other's eggs. In that case, both flatworms now have eggs that they have to find food for. At the end of the day, I'm just glad that I can, with my own two eyes, see a Wikipedia page entitled Penis Fencing. My life is now complete. So yeah, those are some of the weirdest ways that animals reproduce. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe, hit the bell, leave a comment, and watch another video by clicking right here. I'll see you guys later.